Sabbath school lesson, quarter four, lesson two, the family. Hi, my name is Jonathan Peterson. I'm very pleased to be sharing with you this week's Sabbath school lesson about the family. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for creating the family. You created Adam and Eve and told them to be fruitful and multiply and to teach the children. Lord, this is an important lesson and I pray that you give us your Holy Spirit to guide our thoughts and to change our actions if necessary. Help us to be sincere as we study this and to consider how you want us to do things differently or to continue the things we're doing well. Please teach us and give us the courage to change where necessary. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'm very excited to share this lesson with you, everyone. And I want to start with the idea or the principle, uh, which I'm going to call one generation. One generation. Everything can change in one generation. Morals, values, beliefs, and behavior can change in one generation. How is this possible? Well, if one generation does not teach the next generation, well, then the following generation will get their own ideas. They won't inherit the values and the beliefs and the practices of the previous generation. So if a society or if a family is not diligent in passing on their faith to the next generation, it can all be lost and you'll find children of the, of the, of the subsequent generation will turn their backs on God. They won't follow him. Remember, it's not our natural inclination to follow God. Naturally, we follow the broad way, not the narrow way. We have to work hard as parents, as grandparents, aunties, uncles, everyone who's involved in the family. We actually have to put in a lot of effort to pass on our faith because the pull away from our faith, the pull away from faith on our children is immense. So this is a topic which needs serious attention, which needs our dedication and our commitment. There are three important things that we need to consider when we think about um, what influences our children, what influences the next generation. And parents need to really uh, be, be mindful of these three things because these three things determine what goes in the mind and what goes in the mind determines belief, morality, and morality and belief determine action, the way people live. So number one is obviously the raising of children. Who raises the children and how do they raise the children? The raising of children in a godly way must be intentional. It must be constant. It must be consistent and it must be clear. Who's doing this? Is it an institution or is it the parents? It should be the parents. Parents should be the primary influence. How are they doing it? We're going to talk later about some practical ways to raise children um, to follow the Lord. The second factor is this, school and university. The choice of school and university is so critical because um, children and young adults spend a lot of time at school and university. In fact, um, once, they get, once they start school, they're actually going to spend more of the day with um, their teachers and peers than they will with their parents. So you need to be careful. What school are you sending your children to? What are the influences of that school? What are they teaching them? What morals and values are they endeavouring to impart to them? Choose wisely because a lot of young people are led away from the faith of their parents through the school or the university. Universities, um, there's a lot of really ungodly teaching in universities. So um, this, re this results in a lot of young people turning away from their faith. So unless they're well-grounded, university can be a very dangerous place for them. The third thing is the media. You know, the media is all around us. It's ubiquitous. It's everywhere. So we need to be careful what media is entering the minds of our children. Now, we all know there's a lot of ungodly stuff in the media, um, in you know, television, the movies, music, a lot of this is, is not compatible with the message that we as Christian parents are sharing with our children. So we have to be careful 
what we're allowing into our children's minds in terms of the media, but also we need to make sure we're teaching them discernment so that when they do leave home, they will know how to make the right choices um, about what they expose themselves to in terms of the media. Um, now, just on that, I mean, you could have you could do a whole lesson on this, but I, I think I do need to just mention this. Look, just you got to be careful with giving your kid a phone. You give them the phone, you give them access to basically all the media in the world, you know, music, videos, TV shows, movies. Think carefully about that. What are you giving your kid? Um, yeah, you need to have a, as a, if you're a parent, you need to think very, very carefully about when you give your child a phone, what restrictions you place on that phone, laptops as well. Um, but just really, please, I implore you, be careful. Think deeply about what you're exposing your children to because they don't have the self-control yet. Now, uh, I'm going to show you um, a personal example uh, about what I mean when I say one generation and how uh, faith can be lost in one generation. My grandparents grew up in the Methodist church and their whole life uh, was based around the church. So they went to church every week. My grandfather was an elder in the church. Grandmother was a deaconess. And their social life was, was um, based around the church. They were involved in church charity-based activities and so on and so on. They were also teetotalers. Uh, that means that they had uh, chosen to abstain from alcohol for their whole lives. And that was a common thing in the Methodist church at those times. Now, they had two sons, Wendy and Peter. Um, Wendy was my mother. Peter was my uncle. Wendy continued in her faith. Peter didn't. Peter didn't. Now, from Wendy and Peter, there are six grandchildren. Of those six, one is a Christian. That's me. Five are <laughs> not only they're not Christian, they're about as far from it as you can get. I mean, they have just completely turned their back on the um, on the morals and the values of the Christian faith, completely. And whereas my grandparents were teetotalers, uh, you know, five of their grandkids just love their alcohol, just love it, into it. Some of it, some of them in a big way. So. It's lost, you know. How did they lose of the? How did they lose five out of their six grandkids in terms of their faith? How did that happen? Well, I'm not entirely sure, but I um, I do have a suspicion that uh, my grandparents thought that raising children to be Christians meant that you took them to church. But as far as I can glean from my mum. Christian teaching didn't happen at home. So they were church every week, church every week, and, of course, kids can get bored of that sometimes and they see other things um, that other kids are doing, sports and other fun activities, and they go, why do I have to go to church? And if they're not taught at home the importance of church and, you know, the, the, the faith isn't made, you know, vibrant and appealing and, you know, it's not a something they take on board for themselves because of, you know, discussions and teaching with their parents. Um, then they can just tend to think of going to church as a chore but not connect that with a personal faith. And I think that's what happens. So we're going to talk about, the, you know, how to, how to pass on an authentic faith to children as we go through this lesson. Now, let's have a look at Genesis 18 verse 9. Genesis 18 verse 9 talks about, the reason God chose Abraham. Now, remember, most of the world had turned away from God at this time. God wanted to have a people who would represent him in the earth. And so he chose Abraham. Why? It's not a random choice. He didn't just choose Abraham because, you know, he had a, you know, a lottery choice. It, it, was, it was an intentional choice. And, and Genesis 18, 19 tells us this. For I have chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just, so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. So there you have it. God looked at Abraham and thought, this guy's got a desire to be 
to be righteous, to, to be a just and upright man, but not only that, I'll, he'll teach his kids. And I think one way God incentivized this was um, by withholding children from Abraham so that when he did have children, he appreciated them even more. You know, often it's when you don't have something that you really appreciate it. And by, by not having children for so long, and then this child coming out later, the two children, but the children coming later as a blessing, something they never expected. Abraham really appreciated that. And so he made sure that he passed on his faith to his children. Let's now go to a couple of other very famous verses in Deuteronomy about the importance of passing on faith to children. Deuteronomy 4 verse 9. This is God speaking to the children of Israel. Only be careful and watch yourselves closely so that you do not forget the things your eyes have seen or let them fade from your heart as long as you live. Teach them to your children and to their children after them. Well, that means you've got to teach them to your children and your grandchildren. So grandparents, you have an obligation too to teach your children what God has done in your life. Teach them. Let's go to Deuteronomy 6, 6 to 9. This is probably the most famous passage about passing on the faith. My wife and I had this one at our wedding because I thought right then, I thought, well, when we have children, this is our, needs, needs to be our focus um, because I saw what happened with my brothers and my cousins. They all abandoned their faith, and I thought, I do not want that to happen to me. I do not want my children abandon the faith. I couldn't think of anything more heartbreaking than seeing my own children abandoning the faith and living a godless life. It's just horrible. So here we are, Deuteronomy 6, verse 6 to 9. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. And that means you've got to be sincere about it. It's got to be a part of your life, okay? It's not just nominalism or tokenism. Verse 7, impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Okay, let's just pause there. When are we supposed to teach our children? Just at church? And I think this is the example of my grandparents. Let's take the kids to church. That'll do it. That's enough. And then at home, there's no mention. The only mention I, that I can see is that they said grace before meals. But where's the discussion about the things of faith? Where's the storytelling? Where's the study in the scriptures? And this verse says you need to talk to your kids about it when they get up. First thing in the morning, praise the Lord. Let's, you know, how do you do that? Well, we'll talk about some tips later on. Um, when you walk, sorry, when you sit at home, when you're spending time together as a family, you need to talk about the faith. When you walk along the road, well, today that's traveling in the car. How many of us have spiritual discussions in the car? We should be. We should be talking about our faith on the, you know, the long journeys that we take uh, as we go on holidays or, you know, just driving to the shops. Sounds strange, doesn't it? But that's what the Bible's telling us to do when you're walking along the road. When you're traveling, talk about the things of God. When you lie down, that's when you're going to bed. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. What's this symbolic of? Your hands symbolize your actions. Make sure that your actions follow the commands of the Lord and bring glory to God. Bind them on your foreheads. The forehead represents the mind. Keep the law of God in your mind so that your thinking, your thinking is in line with the ways of God. Verse 9, write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. The home that you dwell in should be dedicated to God and everything that happens in that home should be according to the ways of God, should be uplifting the law of the Lord. And the children should be able to see that. If you don't demonstrate that, they will see through you. Kids can detect a lack of authenticity. Kids can detect hypocrisy. So don't be a faker. Don't go to church. Smile at everyone. You know, happy Sabbath, everyone, and be the nice guy at church, the nice dad, the perfect father, and then back at home, you don't have that love. Don't be like that. The kids will see straight through you and they're not going to follow the faith. 
if you're not authentic in your faith, if you're a, you know, if you're an unpleasant dad, if you're an unloving father at home, but you're the showman at church, it's not going to work. It's just not going to work. The kids will see straight through you. Okay. Now, let's go to Judges 2, verse 7. This is a sad verse, really, very sad verse, because, you know, we just read that um, the Israelites were to teach their children and their children's children. Well, how did that go? Let's see. Judges 2, verse 7. The people served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlived him and who had seen all the great things the Lord had done for Israel. Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. Let's go to verse 10. After that, the oh, sorry, after that whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors, so that whole generation had died, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. How is this possible? How is it that this generation, the following generation, didn't know the Lord and didn't know what the Lord had done for Israel. To me, this indicates that there was definitely a deficiency in passing on the faith to the next generation. They were not following Deuteronomy 6. Impress them upon your children. Teach them. When you get up, when you're sitting around the house, when you're traveling, when you lie down, teach them, teach them, teach them. This mustn't have happened because it says this generation after Joshua did not know the Lord. Now, we know what Joshua and that generation saw and experienced. What went wrong? Obviously, there was something wrong in the families here. And the, the outcome, the outcome is in verse 11. Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. Verse 12, they forsook the Lord, the God of their ancestors who had brought them out of Egypt. Such a sad story, and we do not want that to be our experience where we are, you know, we are saved by the Lord and then our children turn their backs on God and follow the world. You know, that's the last thing we want. So we really need to focus on prioritising the family. I'm going to take you now to Psalm 78. Psalm 78. Psalm 78 verses 1 to 8 says this, My people, hear my teaching, listen to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth with a parable. I will utter hidden things, things from of old, things we have heard and known, things our ancestors have told us. We will not hide them from their descendants. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord his power and the wonders he has done. Is that what we're doing? Are we telling the next generation what do we need to tell them? The praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power and the wonders he has done. Verse 5, he decreed statutes for Jacob and established the law in Israel, which he commanded our ancestors to teach their children. He commanded them. We just read in Deuteronomy 6. He commanded them to teach their children. Verse 6, so the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born, and they in turn would tell their children. Now, I've prayed this prayer in my heart to the Lord. Lord, I don't know when you're coming back, so I don't know how many descendants I will have, but I pray that every one of my descendants will be in your kingdom. My children my grandchildren, great-grandchildren. I want to do such a good job of raising my children that they will teach their children and their children will teach the next generation. Why should it be that any of my descendants are not in the kingdom? Why should that be the case? Anyway, that's the prayer that I've prayed. Um, I'll continue to pray that my children will raise their children right and keep the commands of the Lord and follow his ways. Where are we up to? Uh, Psalm 78, verse 7. Then 
they would put their trust in God and would not forget his deeds but would keep his commands. They would not be like their ancestors. We read about their ancestors in Judges just then. A stubborn and rebellious generation whose hearts were not loyal to God, whose spirits were not faithful to him. So if we want to make sure our children stay loyal to God, unlike the Israelites of old, we need to be doing a good job in the family in providing education through the family unit. God gave us the family unit to pass on this education, this knowledge of him to the children, the next generation. Um, Christian education, from what we've seen in the scriptures, is supposed to be is supposed to take place in the home, not in the church. In the home, primarily. The church plays a supporting role and other people and institutions such as schools and universities can play a supporting role. But the bulk of the bulk of spiritual Christian education is supposed to take place in the home and is the responsibility of the parents. We should not be expecting other people to be spiritually educating our children and guiding them in their faith. That's the role of the parents. Now, parents, if you're not spending time with your kids, if you're too busy working, it's not going to happen. So you have to commit time to this. It takes time. There's a colleague of mine at work. He's a Christian. And uh, he said that his philosophy... Um, for raising his children and, and educating them in the faith was this. I take them to church each week and I send them to youth on Fridays. He said, that's all I thought I needed to do. I thought that was my responsibility as a parent. He says, we never spoke of the gospel at home. We never spoke about God. We never had Bible studies. We never had prayer. I thought I was doing my, a good job there. Take him to church each week, send him to youth each Friday night. Well, what are the results? Two out of three of his children are not in the faith. So obviously it's not enough. It's not enough to just take them to church each week, send them to youth once a week. It's not enough. And we just read clearly in Deuteronomy that it's got to be far more consistent than that and you cannot outsource the the spiritual education of your children. And too many parents think they can outsource it. I'll just pay someone else to do it. Um, you know, pay a childcare institution to do it, pay a school to do it. No, it's not their job. It's your job as a parent. And as a grandparent, it's your job. And uh, auntie and uncle, everyone in the family is involved, but particularly the parents, it's your job. Do not outsource it. Let's go. That was a big introduction, but um, I think we covered a lot of ground there. Let's go to Sunday's lesson, the first family. And we're going to cover a lot of these briefly because there's actually not a great deal of detail in them. In, in this um, lesson on Sunday, what we learn is um, from our first lesson, from lesson one last week, that uh, nature was to be the primary lesson book for, you know, um, the first family and that the primary teachers, of course, were the parents because there was, there was no one else. So it was Adam and Eve's responsibility to pass on their faith to their children and were given the example that both Cain and Abel knew that they had to offer a sacrifice. Well, was there something deficient in the teaching of the parents that um, Cain didn't bring the right sacrifice? Or was he just stubborn and rebellious? Or was it a bit of both? I'm not sure. We don't have a lot of detail. Um, but that does show us that, of course, the parents play the primary role in educating the children spiritually. Let's go to Monday's lesson, The Childhood of Jesus. Once again, we have very little information about the um, upbringing of Jesus, his childhood, his education. But I'll um, posit this question. If you knew that you were going to die soon and you had to find another family to take care of your children, how careful would you be in choosing the, the family who were going to you know, raise your children for you? How careful would you be? You'd put a lot of thought into that, wouldn't you? You wouldn't just pass them on to anyone. You'd be very, very selective and have 
uh, criteria, very specific criteria about who was, who was going to raise your children. Well, God was in that position. He was going to give his son to the world and have his son be born as a human. But he needed a mother and a father to raise his to raise Jesus. Who would he choose? Well, he could choose from thousands. He did he didn't just make a random choice. If you were going to choose someone to raise your children and you could choose from any, you know, young couple in Israel, you'd choose the best. And that's what God did. He found a a woman and a man who had a a strong faith, who had a sincere love for him. In Luke one twenty eight, it tells us about Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favoured one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. Mary was chosen because of her faith and because God knew that she would do the best job of raising Jesus, teaching him the ways of the Lord. And then about Joseph, not much is said about Joseph, but we're told that he was a just man. So both Mary and Joseph were God-fearing parents and they obviously obviously taught Jesus very, very well because we see when Jesus went to the temple, he had a great deal of knowledge. Now, a a lot of that was directly from God, but I'm sure a lot of that also came through his parents and their diligence in teaching Jesus the scriptures, not just the scriptures, but how to have that personal connection with the Father. Tuesday, communication. Tuesday's lesson is about communication. Uh, You might have heard this little phrase. People don't care what you know until they know that you care. So what this phrase highlights is that the foundation of effective communication is relationship. You know, if you really want to pass on any knowledge, whether it be, you know, faith-based or non-faith-based, you're going to do a much better job of it if you have a good relationship with the person you're sharing it with. So what this means from a family perspective is that parents must have a positive relationship with their children. Your children must know that you love them, you care for them, that you have their best interest in heart. How do you do this? You tell them. Uh, the number of people that I've heard that have said, you know, when I was a kid, my parents never told me that they loved me. How sad. How sad. It's not hard. You say to your kids, I love you. And you say it regularly. You say it often. Tell them that you love them. Back that up with your actions, though. You know, show them affection. Have fun with them. Play with them. Spend time with them. Show an interest in what they're interested in. You've got to invest time with your children. Show them that the, that what makes you happiest is their joy. Each child is an individual. Now, this is the second principle in relationships. When you develop a relationship with someone, you get to know them well and you get to know them as an individual. And what this does is it allows us to communicate in the most effective way according to their personality, according to their character. For example, my oldest son, um, as he was getting into teenagers, he really loved apologetics. And so we'd spend time talking about apologetic arguments. He then shared that with his friend and he was so... Um, so interested and so excited about sharing his faith from an apologetic perspective that he decided to enter ministry and theology because he thought this is the this is the greatest thing I can do to share my faith. And the, this particular friend um, had a mind for you know for reason and logic and argument, and so he was really fascinated by the apolog- apologetic arguments because he, of course, had that typical impression that. Christians just believe by blind faith. It's just a feeling that they have. Uh, my second son, he's at the moment, he's into politics. He also likes delving into uh, creation from a scientific perspective. So I spend time talking to him about that, buy him resources to help him explore that deeper. And we have great conversations about that. My youngest son, 
at the moment, he just loves spending time with me. So I make sure I commit a lot of time with him. Uh, I show an interest in his hobbies. Um, you know, we play the games together that he likes to play. And then that opens up this door for me sharing the gospel because I'm invested in him and he knows that. We need to be authentic with our children and we may need to make sure that, as I said earlier, that we're not one person at church and a different person at home. We need to show our love for them. We need to build a positive relationship with them. And that's going to make sharing our faith, communicating our faith far more effective. Let's look at Wednesday's lesson, the role of parents. For this one, I'm going to start with Proverbs 1 verse 8, the role of parents. My son, hear the instruction of your father and do not forsake the law of your mother. We have a critical role here as parents to uh, instruct our children to teach them God's laws and God's ways. And um, Solomon wanted to pass this on to his children as well. Let's go now to Ephesians 5. And we're going to start at verse 22, and we're going to read through a fair few verses here because these verses talk about the structure and the order of the family, how things are supposed to operate in the Christian family. Ephesians 5, 22. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the saviour. So the order in the home is that the husband is the head and the wife uh, is the support for the husband. Verse 24. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Quite unpopular verse these days, but uh, just read it and follow it. That's all I'm going to say there. Don't try to fight against that. If you fight against it, you're, causing, you're going to cause grief to yourself and your family. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. So this is the the balancing verse to the previous one. Uh, Do not let people uh, try to persuade you that the word submit here means that you're some kind of a, a slave or a servant to the husband. This is not what this is talking about. Just as in um, just as in my job, you know, I have a boss and I submit to the boss, it doesn't mean uh, that he's nasty or mean or hostile or that I'm some kind of a, a slave. You know, I'm there voluntarily. If I don't like the job, I can leave. But while I'm at the job, he is in the role of, uh, he has the role of authority there. We have a good relationship. But ultimately, he will be the decision maker and I'll have to, I'll follow those rules. I'll willingly submit to the authority of the boss or whatever superior I have at work. So it's, it's a role that's given. Um, but the balance of that in the husband-wife relationship is this, that when the husband puts his wife first and loves his wife in a self-sacrificial way as Christ loved the church, uh, then the wife choosing to submit to the leadership, to the headship, to the guidance of the husband uh, becomes a joyful thing and it becomes a beneficial thing for the whole family. Anyway, that's the model. And if that model is in the home, it's going to be better, better for the kids. Verse 29, after all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does for the church, for your members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. I'm just going to make a little point here. The man will leave his father and mother. Don't stay too close to your father and mother or to the in-laws family. They tend to have have, um, uh, an interfering influence. When you get married, you need to establish your own family. You need to establish... Uh, your own headship of your home, your own um, 
your own family culture. Um, and whilst the grandparents uh, can play a very, very strong supporting role, it's not, they have their own relationship and they have their, you know, their own uh, marriage. And so you do need to, that's why God says leave. Don't stay together with them. Don't stay too close with them uh, in terms of physical, you know. Um, establish your, your own family. That's what God is saying. You, you, you and your, the husband and wife need to establish their own family uh, independent of, uh, of the parents, um, but hopefully following the example of the parents and staying in close relationship with the parents too. Um, verse 32, this is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ in the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself and the wife must respect her husband. Husbands, love your, love your wives. This is, this is such a healthy and important thing for the children they must see very, very clearly that the husband loves his wife immensely. This is going to do a great deal for your children. And if they want to have, if you want the children to have a positive image of Christ and of our Heavenly Father, you need to show them by loving your wife. Because it says we need to love as Christ loved the church. So we the the the, the father's wife uh, sorry the father's love for the wife, you know, is supposed to be a reflection of that love that Christ has for the church. So, if you're a husband, you know, love your wife. Make sure your children can see that, and the wife show respect for your husband. Show respect for your husband. Chapter six, verse one. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honour your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Um, so it seems, he, it seems to be here fathers can tend to <laughs> exasperate or frustrate their children perhaps by being too strict perhaps by not being understanding that, you know, they're still children and they make mistakes, uh, being harsh, being too disciplinarian, you know. Think about the effect that you're having on your kids. Uh, do they feel exasperated? I can't do anything right for my dad. Oh, I'm just, no, nothing ever satisfies him. He's always, you know, getting cranky with me. Don't exasperate your kids, but bring them up in the... Um, instruction and the training of the Lord. Okay, let's continue. Um, so what this tells us once again is that parents take the primary role of raising the children. Now, before school, it's most likely going to be the mother um, because she's the one that gives birth and then you know, feeds the baby. Uh, and so the... Um, the children need to be taught from the youngest age. Well, first they need to be shown love from the mother, then they need to be taught from the mother. Now, uh, if possible, I will make a recommendation, if possible, spend a few years with your kids because if you do put them into um, some kind of a um, uh, childcare centre, they will teach your children, but they may not teach them uh, what you want them to be taught. So... If possible, I do encourage the mothers to make the financial sacrifice to spend the first few years of the children's life with them, be the primary um, educator in those first few years. And, you know, there might be a financial sacrifice, but there will be an eternal gain. God will reward that and um, you'll see the difference there. Uh, yeah, I did that. My wife and I did that. Uh, we did make a lot of financial sacrifices you know, we had cheap cars. Well, we only had one car for a long time. It was so cheap. <laughs> but anyway, uh, small house. We didn't, you know, go on holidays. We rarely ate out, didn't buy fancy clothes. So we were very careful with our spending because we prioritised my wife raising the children and just had the one income. And we're very, very glad we did that. So I do, I do encourage that. And certainly the Bible does um, prioritise uh, having the uh, the parents as the primary educators, particularly in those early years before they're at school because then school starts to play a significant role as well. When the kids get to school age, as I said before, be careful about what school you send them to. Um, 
in the school system, there are many things uh, that they are teaching the kids now that are contrary to the gospel. Uh, ideally, what the school teaches should back up what the parents are teaching at home. Otherwise, the kids are getting these conflicting messages and they get confused. So I would say if you have an Adventist school in your area and you can afford it, that's your first choice because that's going to back you up in terms of what you're teaching them at home. If there is no Adventist school, try to find uh, another Christian school. I teach at a Christian school. It's a, an interdenominational one, and so I've sent my kids there. And this is an authentic Christian school where the gospel is taught and um, all, of the, all of the staff are Christian. So if you can, uh, find yourself, you know, it doesn't have to be an expensive school. It can be a low-fee Christian school. The one I teach at is a low-fee Christian school. And a lot of parents make, um, make sacrifices to send their kids there. Um, but I, I know for sure that my kids are getting taught the gospel and they're being encouraged to grow in their faith and the school's backing me up with what I'm teaching at home. Um, and some parents also choose to homeschool, and that's, that's another option as well. Uh, then with university, this is where many people fall from their faith. So, you know, have a think about that. Uh, Avondale College is a great option where you have uh, Adventist lecturers, um, but of course they don't provide all the courses. So if, the, if, the, um, if your children do need to go to university, uh, secular university, you know, I think you want to really encourage them to be active in a church when they, um, if they have to move, um, make some good Adventist friends where they move and maybe get involved in um, a campus group, a Christian campus group. That might be helpful as well. Let's go to Thursday's lessons. lesson, lest you forget, lest you forget. Okay. Um, in Deuteronomy 6, the Israelites were told to teach their children about what had happened in the past, okay, what you'd experienced coming out of Egypt, all the miracles and so on. Now, today we have so much more that we can share because so much of history has passed. So what should we be teaching our children? Okay, here's what we should be teaching our children in terms of the past, lest we forget. So firstly, we need to teach them about our own faith. How did you become a Christian? How did you become an Adventist? Um, your personal journey of faith, your personal testimony. Secondly, probably worthwhile to teach them about the history of your local church. When did your church start up? Who started it up? Um, how long has it been around for? How did it grow? If you have that information, that's good to pass that on to them as well. Maybe talk to some of the... Um, uh, some of the more elderly folk in the church, see if they can remember things or if they can share with you some insights into the church history. Thirdly, we need to talk about the, the, the Seventh-day Adventist church and its history. Our kids need to know this. Um, you know, we all know that famous quote from Ellen White, we have nothing to fear for the future except, except that we forget the way the Lord has led us in the past and his teachings, you know. So we do need to teach our kids why, what is this importance and significance of the, and relevance of the Seventh-day Adventist church. They need to know about the 1844 movement. You know, they need to know about um, the Three Angels' messages, the prophecies that point to our, our movement. We need to teach them this. Otherwise, when they grow up, they're going to go, okay, well, maybe I'll stay a Christian, but I'll just join any church because it really, really doesn't matter. There's no difference. So they need to understand the distinctive differences between um, other churches in our church, uh, because our church has been is a, is a movement that's been called for a specific purpose. So we need to teach them that history. Next, we also need to teach them the history of the church. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, you know we're talking from the time of when the um, New Testament uh, finished, and then we talk to them about the the two thousand year history of the church. Uh, with, I suppose with particular emphasis on, you know, the Dark Ages and then the Reformation and then the rise of the various Protestant churches. So, um, you know, they can get a lot of this history from the Great Controversy and there's some actually some good films about, um, about church history as well. A couple of good films about Martin Luther and uh, what's that one, Amazing Grace. Yeah, there's a good few, few films about that. Uh, and then... 
We need to teach them about New Testament, the New Testament history, uh, Acts of the Apostles, what Jesus did. And then, of course, we have the whole Old Testament going right back through Genesis. So basically we need to teach them the history of the, of the world from beginning, 6,000 years ago, the creation of Adam and Eve, the history of Israel, <clears throat> their rebellion, the prophecies pointing to Christ, the coming of Christ, the acts and the mission of Christ, his re- death and resurrection, the birth of the church, and then what happened and the spread of the gospel throughout the world, and then what happened after that, the early church, the Dark Ages, the Reformation, the rise of the Adventist church, uh, the rise of your the church in your country perhaps, then the rise of your local church, and then you coming to faith as a result of all that. So there's really a, um, you know, a journey of faith, your, your faith as an individual can be traced all the way back through history. And so uh, it's important to teach the children that, all of that history. Now, finally, I just want to share with you some practical tips um, as a family or as parents that you can do to help raise your children. So firstly, um, you will find in Steps to Jesus or Steps to Christ that Ellen White says that prayer should be our very first thing that we do in the morning. But, you know, when the disciples uh, were hanging around Jesus, one of the things they said to him was, can you teach us how to pray? They didn't really know how to pray. Now, kids are the same. They don't know how to pray. So we need to teach them how to pray. And what I've done with my kids, and you can maybe do this with yours, is I've written a morning prayer, which is based on that prayer uh, from Steps to Christ. Lord, take me today as holy thine, that prayer there. And I've put it in, you know, in more simple language and I've, just kind of added a few bits and pieces. Basically, the prayer is about surrendering yourself to God for that day, asking God to give you strength to live, to lead you not into temptation, to be his servant, to submit to him, uh, for him to be with you through his Holy Spirit, those kinds of things, you know. It's not asking for great weather or good surf. Forget about that. It's not important. It's surrendering the self, surrendering yourself to God. I've printed that up on a card gave it to my kids. I say, kids, leave it on your floor every morning so that when you wake up, it's the first thing you see, you're going to remember to pray every morning. Uh, If you have time, pray with them. If you're driving them to school, pray with them in the car if you don't have time at home. But spend that time with the kids, just telling them, to teaching them to focus, um, focus their attention on God and commit themselves to God first thing in the morning and and to commit the day to God. Okay, the second thing you can do is uh, I've got, what have I got? 12 things, I'll go through them quickly for you. Second thing you really should do is have family worship. Um, now I find the best time to have this is at night time. The, pressure, the time pressure's off. In the morning you've got, uh, it's a bit more of a rush. So if you can do it in the morning, that's good. But if not, you can certainly spend a bit of time in the evening. Um, what do you do for family worship? You sing some songs, have some Bible stories, maybe have a Bible quiz, uh, Bible games, um, there's a whole lot of things you could do. You can go through the Sabbath school lesson. Um, you can read a chapter of the Bible each night. We've recently been through Steps to Jesus, reading a few pages from Steps to Jesus each night. There's a whole range of things you can do. But it's coming together as a family and saying, we're putting God first. We're going to focus our attention on God. And we're going to ask God to guide guide us as a family and as individuals. And it's lovely spending spending that time together as a family and family worship and it'll create a great memory for the kids. Okay, the third thing is you need to pray over your children and pray regularly. Um, There's a number of prayers in the Bible that you can borrow. I've used seven prayers that I've found that Paul prayed for the churches and I've used them for my children. And um, it's basically praying for them to grow in the knowledge of Christ, to grow in their relationship of Christ, their understanding of his love um, and pray that they will be kept safe until the second coming. So pray for your children regularly. Uh, Next thing is Bible games. This gets you together as a family. You can do this on Sabbath or any day of the week. It doesn't matter. Um, You might have heard of the the great one that's been produced recently called Go Ye. Uh, That's a great one. And there's some Bible trivia games and uh, there's a whole lot of good Bible games you can find. But it's great to to join you, to to get you to come together as a family. Uh, Next one is um, doing Bible studies but creating charts, charts of things from the Bible. So this is a good way of extracting extracting information from the Scriptures and presenting in a visual way. 
such as in a chart. For example, you could do a chronology of the kings of Israel and Judah, or you could get a map of um, Europe and the Middle East and trace the journeys of Paul. Now, when children do that themselves, they learn a lot more than if you just presented that with them. I know you can get, you know, charts of these things, but if you get kids to reduce that for themselves from their own study or, you know, when you study with them, it's going to stick in the head a lot more and it's a way more fun than just looking at what someone else has done. Uh, next tip is authenticity. I think I've uh, shared this with you earlier. Your life must show your faith. Show the fruits of your spirit of the Spirit in your life. Don't be a hypocrite. Kids will see right through you. Tip number seven is I'm going to recommend two books for you, The Adventist Home and Child Guidance. They're full of great advice. Um, if you don't have them, you can get them on a free app. It's the, uh, the Ellen White app. Download it on your phone or on your iPad and um, you can read them anytime you like. There's just got so much wisdom in them. Uh, next, uh, tip number eight, help your kids to share their faith. You know, muscles that aren't worked atrophy, they die. A faith that is not put into action will die. So you need to encourage your kids to be sharing their faith and the best place for them to share their faith is at school because they see their friends every day. So you ask them to you know, identify a friend of theirs, someone who they're mixing with regularly, who's not a Christian, and then you talk about how you're going to share that faith and then you pray for them as well. How are you going to share your faith? Well, we use Christ's method alone, which is um, spend time with them, show them, show them that you care, you help them out, and then you, you look for opportunities to talk. You don't just go and talk. You build the relationship first. Okay. Tip number nine is apologetics. You need to provide evidence for the kid's faith. So look at evidence for creation, historicity of the Bible, evidence of changed lives of people, miracles that have happened not only in the scriptures but also in recent times, healings and so on. Um, the evidence for, for, for scripture, you know, the, the eyewitness accounts of the gospels or some of the gospels and so on. Um then when they are confronted with some of the worldly arguments against the scriptures, they've got a defense. You don't send them, you don't send someone out to battle without some kind of defense or, or being being armed, you know. They've got to have they've got to have a strong foundation for what they believe. So teach them the apologetics. Number 10, tip number 10 is resources. Always be on the lookout for good resources for your kids, Christian videos, Christian books, things that they can um, spend time in on the Sabbath. You know, sometimes the Sabbath hours can be a bit long for kids, but if they've got uh, some good books, music, audio stories, videos, and so on, um, they can be filling their minds with spiritual things uh, whilst being occupied. Uh, tip number 11 is doctrine. Teach them the doctrines of our faith. Go through the 28 fundamentals with them and explain why they're important, why they, where they come from in the scriptures. There's some good children's books on these. You can get them from Better Books, um, which present the 28 fundamentals in a simple way, backed up by stories with some questions as well. So make sure you do that. Okay, and the final tip is um, discuss Christian perspectives on current issues in the news and the media and maybe things at school. For example, the abortion issue. Well, what's a Christian perspective on that? Talk about things as you see them on the TV, as they hear about them at school or in the media. Um, help them to think about everything from a biblical perspective from a biblical point of view give them the give them the training the skills the tools to be able to apply a biblical mindset to everything that they hear about or experience in the world today because as we know the world is is full of so much ungodly teaching we need to help our kids see um, to be able to discern and, and see everything through a biblical worldview. Help them to do that by using the scriptures. Uh, don't avoid issues. Don't think, oh, this is one that's a bit tricky. I don't know how to do it. 
If you don't know, if you don't understand it, work it out. Ask your pastor, ask an elder, ask someone who who does know how to approach this issue from a biblical perspective. Then you know, talk about it with your with your children. Okay. Well, I hope that was helpful, and I hope you actually implement some strategies from this lesson. I hope this changes us. You know, just sometimes just studying the Bible and and enjoying gorging ourselves on the Bible is just going to make us fat if we don't put it into action. We really do need to put into action the things we learn in our Sabbath school lesson. So maybe think of one or two things that um, that I've discussed in this lesson and, and write it down and can commit to implementing that, making a change, doing something about it. Anyway, that's my uh, encouragement for you. Let's close in prayer. We had a great time studying this lesson and um, realizing just how important the family is in raising up that next generation. And remember, if we don't if we don't do this, if we don't pass it on to the children, within one generation it can all be lost. So let's make a sincere effort to pass on our faith to the next generation. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, once again we want to thank you for families. We thank you that this Sabbath school lesson focused on families and reminded us of the importance of of the family in educating the next generation. We do need to pass our faith on, and so we commit to doing that. Please forgive us for where we have failed, for where we have been negligent, for prioritizing other things, for prioritizing work, for not giving time to our kids, for not sticking to our commitments, for a whole range of things, Lord. We ask your forgiveness. Please give us the strength and the um, perseverance to just keep going with it because so much is at stake here. Eternity is at stake. You know, our children's salvation is at stake. We, we really need to be committed. So please help us, guide us by your Holy Spirit and help us to be faithful in educating our children and our grandchildren, the next generation, to follow you, to love you and to serve you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, thanks everyone. It's been great sharing that with you. Um, God bless. Until next time.